So uh, kia ora Nesta, um, it's lovely to have this opportunity to talk to you today and for you to share a little bit of your thinking in the run up to the next PISA conference in December. So I thought uh, just to start off with that um, you could tell us a little bit about your background just for those of us that might not um, know. <laughs> it's sort of you know, when you're talking about your background, there's always a selective process going on, isn't there? Mm -hmm. So what is relevant to this particular context? So I'm I, I'm actually an immigrant to New Zealand, came when I was very young and grew up in rural New Zealand, which is kind of an event in itself. If you've read Alison Jones's book, you'll understand something about um, rural New Zealand. So someone once described the context to me as feudal, and it was a bit like that. Um, very sort of racist, not in an intentional way, but just actually racist, um, the context of my growing up. Anyway, um, I've become became interested in um, Maori thinking and Pacific thinking, and I've spent a lot of time over the last however many years, um, working in those fields, trying to trying to do something. Rangi Walker described himself as a, a translator of Māori thinking to English and English thinking to Māori, and I always thought that was an extremely good model of a way to be, to be, of course, what happens then is you get flack from both sides, but it's... Um, it's it's an interesting um, space to to um, inhabit. It's philosophically interesting too. I've just written a paper on this for Monica um, mm. Kurloska Steinbach, so my head's a bit full of it. Um, in that, if you're going to inhabit this space, you um, you need to really have. I'm going to say abandon a notion that um, a one way of thinking is the best way or the only way and be able to inhabit ways of thinking. So that's kind of what I've tried to do. Um, while I was still teaching, this was, but when I went to the University of Auckland and studied with Jim Marshall, I guess I started to move towards a bit more philosophic position on this. So I would use um, Foucault from his, a paper he wrote called, which is just called Two Lectures, and it's in Power Knowledge, where he describes um, knowledge or in the social field as law, education, so forth. We're not talking about the hard sciences um, as being really imposed by whoever was the most recent invader in a society. And he also talks about um, submerged knowledges, the, the knowledges of the people who have been overcome. Um, and those are the knowledges I find really interesting. And they're interesting in their, for their own sake, and also, you know, to, to, to highlight them, to bring them out from the shadows, as it were. And that's what I do with a lot of my supervision mm. but also they're an interesting corrective to um any assumption that western knowledge is the be all and end all you know this this is a ready and immediate source of critique mm. which i always find very um interesting um and attractive so so that's that's um if we're talking about place and knowledge <clears throat> New Zealand is a great place for this kind of critique because we have not just Māori here but also Pacific people who come also with a whole lot of submerged knowledges um, which are incredibly, um, what would you say, useful um, in critiquing our current very individualised, very um, greedy is the only word for it. Yes. Um, Western knowledge, and also including our attitude to mm. the natural world. I think, mm. you know, that 
both Māori and, and Pacific forms of knowledge have a huge amount to teach us about our attitude to the to the natural world and and living with it rather than mm. on it and exploiting mm. it. So, yes. but you know, you can, you can back this up with Heidegger or whoever. But um, thinking through what you're saying, and I can see so many alignments with um, philosophies of education that I'm um, fascinated by grappling with, and um, I'm sure that we will be able to discuss things like posthumanism and new materialism and the various critiques that follow. All those sorts of things, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, there's, there's, there's these layers of complexity and um, it, it leads me on just thinking about, um, you know, how do we um, have a more equitable, rights-based, um, braided river um, of honouring Indigenous knowledges, honouring Māori Pacifica knowledges, or more than honouring, just being with and belonging with them. Um, and thinking of this question of what do you think the biggest challenges that we face in education and philosophy of education today, and um, it might not be exactly what was on your mind, but I'm just feeling that some of this um, political rhetoric and the climate that we're in at the moment with um, certain ideological <laughs> um, bents that are coming up, um, you know, that can would, would be a very sort of imminent threat perhaps to... to, to some yeah, of... well, I think one of the biggest challenges to philosophy of education is, is that it might limit itself to education. Um, because if you do that, you become entrenched in simply thinking about, you know, the classroom or even education policy. Mm. And I think you have to get outside of that. You have to think of philosophy in a much, in politics, in a broader way. Um, because it's from outside that the influences come on the classroom. The classroom is the schools, classrooms, even the kind of education that happens in the family. It, it doesn't happen in isolation. It happens in a, a much broader national and, and international context. And I think one of the big challenges at the moment, I've, uh, I don't like getting involved in the sort of freedom of speech um, debate because it's so taken over by um, very right-wing, very masculine sorts of people. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I think that there are challenges to freedom of speech, challenges to women's freedom of speech to start with. Women have always um, struggled, really, to to get equal airtime, as it were. And mm -hmm. I think the struggle has become more intense as, as um, uh, the Jordan Petersons of the world or the Andrew Tates of the world become more and more vocal and have have almost um, appropriated the language of freedom, the language of freedom of speech. Um, so I think that that kind of thing is a real threat to the freedom of speech of, of anybody, uh, but particularly academics. There are also political challenges. Um, and I think we have to bear in mind that we're we, we think of ourselves as being part of the Western world of having freedom, political freedom of speech and so forth. And, you know, I, I kind of wonder sometimes to what extent that's true. But we exist in a wider world. And I think that the lack of freedom of speech in China, for instance, or in Russia or Iran, um, has implications for us. Um for our students, if not for any in any other way, but we can't remain little islands secure from this. <clears throat> I mean, you know, China, India, huge percentage of the world's populations. We can't um, pretend that we're not involved. I mean, if we don't think about it at all, then we become complicit mm -hmm. in, um, in these restrictions. Mm -hmm. So I think that that those sorts of the political context I think is um, is always relevant to the exercise of philosophical freedom, mm -hmm. philosophical the ability to think philosophically. So there's that. Mm -hmm. 
I had another thought, but it's disappeared out of my head, Jennifer. You'll have to either <laughs> ask the question again or give me something else to think oh, about. Um, well, the, the, the next question was really what do you think the role of philosophy of education has in responding to this challenge um, and um, the uncertain times that we find ourselves in. And you sort of um, really were um, speaking to this um, throughout with the, the last question too. It's that, um, you know, reminding ourselves not to become these sort of siloed, isolated pockets of um, binarized by discipline, you know, to binarized by this is the philosophy of education, or um, and trying to have always have that um, sort of expansive um, sort of rippling out towards the world um, philosophical stance, if, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's um, it can be dangerous, you know. I I, I think. It's all very well to say people should be brave. They just should speak their mind. They should go where the um, <clears throat> where their thinking takes them, and that's a, a um, an advice of perfection. Mm. But I think we need to um, recognise that for some people, speaking their mind can be dangerous, and and support them. Uh, however, that whatever form that support might take. And I'm not sure yet how, how the philosophy of Education Society of Australasia mm -hmm. um, can formulate that. One of the things that I, I did as when I was president and I've continued to do is to support um, the inclusion of Māori and Indigenous people in the society because when I joined... <laughs> There were 12 men, I think, and one woman, Felicity Haynes. Mm -hmm. And I think I've said this before, that the men were virtually indistinguishable from each other. They were all large, bearded men <laughs> and mm -hmm. all European. And most of them Australian, not all mm -hmm. of them, most of them Australian. And, um, and they were very happy with the way things were at that time. So including more women to start with, and then making the society a comfortable place to be mm. for people from other places and other cultures and, and not just, you know, the other cultures, but from our own Indigenous cultures. Um, mm. It took quite some time, quite some effort. So, you know, making the society an embracing place to be is a, um, it's, it's not a challenge that we've faced and overcome. It is an ongoing challenge. It is something that we have to think about all the time because there's always this temptation to revert to um, to what we know mm. and, and, and to the arguments that we're familiar with. My... Um, Favourite phrase, it's a, a sure signal of a reversion of this kind, is the phrase, but surely. Anytime anybody says, but surely, I know what's coming. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. No, as, yes, and even as you're saying this, the, the freedom to discuss um, what is and isn't problematic within the spaces that you inhabit every day and in academia and beyond and society and how they all in, intermingle together. And um, it's a constant uh, grappling for myself, um, uh, you know, being a, a, a neurodivergent academic, um, if I can even be comfortable with that label for myself. I was um, watching a, um, a a talk by um, a, a Maori lady saying she is Maori, but she is neurodivergent, but she is both. Um, but it's not just her being split between two worlds; it's her being split um, between brain and body, and, um, <laughs> land and place, and. Um, you know, it's a fracture. It's a fracturing of herself, and it comes from within and without. And I just found that um, a really, um, you know, I wished I could um, continue that dialogue. I just, um, you know, as an audience. even that split between brain and body is mm. philosophically based. Mm. 
and isn't um, isn't universal. You know that that mm. that notion that <coughs> it's a um, Cartesian notion. Yes, and, and there is a brain and a body, and and that mm. they're two different things. Mm. And I think if you can start to think outside of that, to think, you know, my brain and my body are the same thing. Um, mm. And but then. Yeah then you know the world becomes a slightly different place but it's a very hard thing for Europeans to get past that mm, um yeah and that's something um that I must admit is a constant grappling within um a, you know not drawing it away from yourself but um post-humanism is to decenter the human um, yet there's, there's so many intrinsic human notions and tied up with um, so many different disciplines and the fact that um, when you do have um, this neurodivergence, um, your brain does seem to um, stop talking to your body sometimes or stop talking um, and that conversation isn't happening. Um, and therefore you start to almost think in Cartesian ways, um, even if it's, um, and it embeds itself in your philosophical um, ponderings as well, um, and it's that, um, you know, and, and trying to stay embodied within that space is, is interesting. So, so what I would say about that is, <clears throat> if it's useful, use it, you mm -hmm. know, if that's a useful concept. Mm -hmm. then use it, but just don't assume that it's the only concept that you might yes. use. Yes, um, and that's, that's it. I think this is why these um, interviews for the um, PISA conference are, um, you know, actually really fruitful spaces um, because I came into this thinking I've got a series of questions to ask Nesta, um, and yet it's becoming so much more organic and conversational and um uh, you know I, I often think of it like a river that sort of starts off from a um or, or um you know and can branch out into all these different avenues that meandering mm. i'm quite good at meandering <laughs> oh, so, so. <laughs> but um yep. yes it's um no i think it's going to be um such a fantastic opportunity to listen to um, your perspectives and other philosophers of education's perspectives and wider indigenous uh, Maori Pacifica perspectives um, and, um, you know, the, all those sort of those cross-cultural nuances <laughs> within philosophy will be fabulous if we can um, you know, rather than silo those, highlight them and mingle and mash and entangle <laughs> a little bit. But mm. <laughs> yeah, that there's a challenge in that, isn't there? Because mm. if you're mingling <laughs> and everybody is affected by what they hear or listen or think about, so nobody is um, going to preserve their own thinking intact. But you still want to preserve some sense of difference. And this is, the, I guess, um, this is the, the major problem about post-structuralism is that I think there are differences. Um, and we have to acknowledge those differences. Mm. So um, in terms of all sorts of things, um, the... Um, neurodivergence is, I suppose, a, an example where you can't just say, well, no, it's social. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's learned, what have you. I think we can be pretty sure that actually there is a, a kind of an organic um, uh, point of difference. What we do with that understanding that there is a point of difference, I think, is where the, uh, the issue of the ethics comes in you know mm. do we try then to assimilate people so there is no longer a point of difference do we live with that point of difference and for some people living with that difference when you can um, actually deal with it other ways either you know maybe by training or by <coughs> one of my a child that I'm very close to has recently been diagnosed with ADHD, and mm. he's taking medication for that. Um, 
And the difference it has made to him is absolutely astounding. So we had the longest, most involved conversation. I was absolutely blown away by what he knows and what he thinks about. Mm -hmm. But he could sustain this conversation with the help of, with chemical help, shall we say. Mm -hmm. So oh. I'm not... <laughs> So where, where do we where do we draw the line here about where we respect difference and where we try to um, adapt to it or where we actually say well no that's not that's not okay we need to do something about it you know mm -hmm. I think um, maybe every case is, needs to be taken on its own merits but there is certainly a, there's a huge ethical question there and mm -hmm. I just think it's an ethical question I'm going to leave unanswered. Mm -hmm. um, because it's too big for me. Yeah, and and that's it. Is that um, you know that I think beginning in the philosophy of education of being very um, in, in these new spaces is that sort of um, uh, it's a very Western concept of needing to know and needing to name and needing to categorize. Um, that um, you know in moments you just um, especially especially within um, neurodivergence or neurodiversity is a sort of um, you know an empowerment of um, of a label and the disempowerment of it and sort of yeah. equal measure. So That's right. yes. Mm, mm. Um, and no, I'm just, um, it's been, you know, such a pleasure um, to um, hear some of your thinking and understandings and, um, you know, is there anything else that you would like to talk about or do you sort of feel that you could, we could just diverge and turn the record off and keep talking or? <laughs> um, well, I think I've talked about the things that are most important to me in very, very broad terms. Um, you know, I think that the, going back to the philosophy of education society, I think it's a, it's a complex organisation and, and the, the challenges that it faces are complex. And I wouldn't be like, I wouldn't like to give any kind of quick answers to any of the challenges or any of the um, mm. structural problems mm. that it changed. But I think it's a really important society to um, um, to keep alive. It's, mm. yeah, um, in a way it represents some sort of hope for the future that we don't become too homogenised and um, that we continue to think of these challenges and think them in a very um, embracing kind of way. Mm. 